in person and via webcast for this important media briefing at Policy Roundtable. We will hear from the water. Uh, we will hear about the water affordability challenge from executives representing the nation's leading water associations. The groups will announce their recommendations to Congress and the administration on how to provide for roughly 20 million low-income households, and um, and issue a new two-year study, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Assessment Study, or LUCAP study for short, which examines a variety of methods to structure a nationwide permanent assistance program. Our, our speakers this morning include uh, Robert Pelson, President and CEO of the National Association of Clean Water Companies, Tom Dobbins, CEO of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, Adam Krantz, CEO of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, Tracy Meehan, Executive Director of Government Affairs for the American Water Works Association, and Walt Marlowe, Executive Director, Water Environment Federation. The group's policy memo being released today reflects the joint recommendations for the federal government to establish a permanent low-income assistance program. It also outlines the history of federal water assistance to date and, clean, and key elements um, that the associations believe a successful permanent program must have. Before we dive into the conversation with our panel, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Nathan Gardner-Andrews, Chief Advocacy Officer for the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. Nathan? Thank you very much, May, and good morning, everyone. Uh, let me add my welcome on behalf of the five water associations to our event today. So why are we here this morning? We are here because of the approximately one out of seven U.S. households that struggle to pay their drinking water and clean water bills. Water affordability has been a growing crisis in this country, but it really came to a head during the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Congress stepped in with a temporary low-income household water assistance program, or LIHEAP, excuse me, LIWAP, but funding for that program is set to run out by the end of this year. The federal government has long provided support to low-income households for nutrition through the SNAP program, for heating and energy costs through the Low-Income Household Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, and for other basic life needs, but never for water. But the time has come for a permanent federal low-income assistance program for water. And today, as we kick off Water Week 2023, five of the nation's leading water sector organizations are joining together to directly call on Congress and the administration to create and fund a permanent low-income program for water. In support of this call, we are releasing a low-income water customer assistance program report reflecting 15 months of work and authored by some of the nation's leading experts on water affordability and rate setting issues. The report represents some of the most definitive research to date on the water affordability challenges facing our nation and the various ways that it is possible to structure a permanent federal low income program. The five associations are also releasing today a joint policy memo stating that it is our considered judgment at this moment in time that the most viable and practicable option to establish a permanent low-income water program is by building on the existing LIWAP program at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We are fortunate this morning to be joined by CEOs and executive directors from the five groups, and we will hear from them in just a moment in a roundtable discussion with more insights on the need and recommendation for a permanent program. But first, I'd like to make just a couple of important notes. If you would like to view a copy of the policy memo and the report, please visit www.nakwa.org, click on News and Publications, and then click on the press release that was released this morning that includes links to both documents. Uh, I believe a number of the organizations that are up here today as well have also posted the report and the memo on their websites. Also, on behalf of the five associations, I would like to acknowledge and thank the authors of our study. They are IB Environmental, One Water Econ, Raftelis, Roucher LLC, Gallardi Rothstein Group LLC, and EJ Metrics LLC. I would especially like to thank Eric Rothstein with Gallardi Rothstein Group for his tireless work <coughs> with the consultant team to organize and uh, kind of heard all those cats with that group. They were an amazing group of folks to work with, and I want to thank Eric especially for his work in leading that effort. 
Um, at this point, we'll turn to a, a brief roundtable discussion. We're gonna have a number of questions here that I'm gonna ask our assembled CEOs and executive directors about the report and the recommendation memo. And then at that time, we'll turn to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and I would just note, uh, May already introduced our speakers, but just so folks know, uh, specifically in order, uh, we have Tracy Meehan from AWWA here, Tom Dobbins from AMWA, Adam Krantz from NACWA, Rob Powelson from NOC, and Walter Marlowe from WEF. So the first question, <clears throat> can you each talk a little bit about your perspective on the current water affordability situation in the United States? And Tracy, maybe we'll start with you and then work our way across. Certainly, thanks. And uh, let me also uh, offer uh, AWWA's thanks to NACWA for uh, really pulling this whole long-term effort together, both the report and now the announcement and the policy memo. So really appreciate your leadership on this. Uh, you know, it's pretty clear water rates are going up. They didn't for decades. Now they're going up at multiple uh, times the uh, rate of inflation. Uh, the truth is rates will continue to have to go up to meet the challenges of both aging uh, infrastructure and renewable and new challenges like lead service lines and PFAS. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we have the situation of the income distribution uh, is, um, is asymmetric and we've got people who really are having a hard time paying their bills. So rather than undermining the integrity of the, of the rate structure, and again, there are different varieties of that, we need to take care of people who, who need taking care of, low-income folks. And, um, and, and a program like uh, the HHS program appears to make sense for a number of reasons. First of all, they have a track record now, and they've really leaned into the task of trying to make the program work. And uh, uh, what's more is it deals with two primary issues that we're concerned about. One is trying to avoid or eliminate, minimize shutoffs of service, and also at the same time support uh, water and wastewater utilities in their critical mission of protecting human health and the environment. So all those factors combined, we think, as, as, as uh, Nathan said, our, our judgment is uh, that something like a LIWAP program out of HHS makes sense. And, and that's the case we intend to make to Congress and to the public at large. Tom? <laughs> Tracy put it very well. Um, again, we, uh, we feel like as an industry, we need to stand together and, and, and to address this very important issue to close this hole in the safety net uh, for people who are at risk or are you know, in need of that assistance. So we saw it exacerbated during COVID um, that, that the need for water and the ability to pay for that water um, kind of hit, there was a trend that Tracy identified um, that was exacerbated because of COVID. So, so financially, um, we need to take care of this. We need it for the health of our, our populace, for our society. We need it to keep these water systems going. As Tracy alluded to, um, we are going to, we've been victims of our own success uh, in the sense that we've, we've been so efficient and effective and we've kept rates low for so long, um, but our infrastructure is now coming to the end of its service life. And even with federal funding, we must invest more. And that's going to unfortunately require ratepayers to pay more for their water. And, and that puts those at the bottom end of our economic scale most at risk. Yeah, just very briefly, those are all, all excellent points. I, I don't have a huge amount uh, to add. The two things I, I would just say uh, is we're, we are getting to a point where I think all of the water utilities uh, who many of our groups you know, represent are, are at a point where they want to be charging right, true cost of service. Right? That's what we're, we're aiming for. And the reality is, I think, uh, from a political standpoint, that can be difficult uh, when you're trying to set rates um, and you're dealing with an increasing percentage of your population uh, that's low income. And the wealth gap is obviously widening. And what we need to do is to take away any disincentive that we can to ensure that funds from all sources are meeting the water challenge that we have today, whether it's federal funding, state funding, or local ratepayer-based funding, uh, we have to sort of free uh, the utilities, in my view, to, to be able to address the challenge. And the LIWAP program that we're talking about here uh, this morning uh, is incredibly an incredibly critical component. All of these groups have flown in. Over 30 groups are part of Water Week this week to go and hit Congress and EPA and other federal agencies 
to take our message uh, to policymakers. Every other area has this type of program in place, right? Whether you talk about energy, healthcare, go across the board. The question that, that I think we need to answer at this point is why not water, right? We deserve a permanent program, period. And our, our goal here this week is to raise that issue and ensure that a permanent LIWAP program uh, exists in our country. Thank you, Adam. Let me start by thanking NACWA under Adam's leadership and Nathan for bringing us all together here behind this report. You know, what's, what's amazing is this is not a, 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 um, a Republican or Democratic issue. This is an issue that deserves strong bipartisan support. I represent uh, an organization that represents investor-owned water utilities. We're a 128-year-old association. And to sit here today and realize how important it is to have safe and reliable drinking water service, it's a moral imperative that we join together and use our collective clout and our unified voice in educating Congress on the need for permanent funding for the LIWAP program. As a former state public utility commissioner, I can speak firsthand of the benefits of the LIHEAP program in my state in Pennsylvania, how successful we were working with our gas and electric utilities, getting monies out the door to needy families. Uh, so they wouldn't be shut off during the winter heating season, providing them budget billing options uh, to make sure that they had a sustainable uh, heating source during the winter months and obviously long-term the ability to pay uh, their monthly bill. This program is no different. There's just one caveat. Congress put a word emergency in front of the act to allocate over $1.13 billion for the program. Now we're here this morning to say, Let's make that permanent. You know, if you were to ask me that I'd be sitting here advocating for increased funding for an entitlement program, as I joke with Walt, I never thought I'd be here this morning talking about that. But when you get into this study and you recognize the impact this program has had, by the way, very efficient delivery of dollars. And by the way, a shout out to HHS and how quickly they were able to stand up this program working with state partners. The reality is this program's working it's working quite effectively. It's hitting over a half a million households today. And the reality is, is, is really why we're here today is we need to educate Congress on, on the need to stand this program up permanently. So I'm, I'm honored to join with, uh, with my fellow uh, association, water association leaders. And again, this is not a public versus private issue. This is not a Republican versus Democratic issue. Uh, this is something we all should agree on. And I hope policymakers over the over yonder here uh, can appreciate that message. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, going uh, last, it's hard to add some more points to all the good ones that were made. But I, I think I keep coming back to water is life, right? Without water, none of the rest of the uh, of our civilization, all the great things that we do, is going to happen without water. People need it every day in their lives, as was mentioned earlier. We have food assistance, we have heat assistance, we have other safety net programs. It is about time that we've gotten to water. Uh, you know, Americans deserve clean water. They deserve safe drinking water. Uh, it's an absolute imperative that we have this access for them and continue to make it affordable, especially with the challenges that we have with income distribution, as was mentioned by Tracy at the beginning uh, of the remark. So, uh, just remember, water is essential to life, and we really need to support a program like this. Thanks, Walt. And, and playing off that just a little bit, um, you mentioned the other ways in which in the federal government is supporting low-income households in terms of nutrition, heating, and energy, housing. Why do you think it's taken so long for the discussion around low-income water to take center stage? And maybe we can start with you well, and then work back. I think the point was made earlier. We are a victim of our own success for more than 100 years uh, water utilities have been providing safe, clean drinking water. We've been processing wastewater, cleaning it, returning it to the environment. Look at the difference uh, that we've made in the last 50 years since the Clean Water Act, at how much better our waterways are across the U.S. Uh, so, you know, being that successful, uh, people have not valued water to the level that they've needed to. And as our infrastructure is wearing out, as we need to replace things, as costs are going up, uh, price is going up, and that's having a real, real impact. And now as a country, we're having to come to grips with this. 
Uh, and a, fortunately, a great portion of our country can afford some of these improvements, but we can't leave a segment behind. And that's why a program like this is so important. Nathan, I would add, just to pick up on what Walt said, and we do take it for granted, you know, here is the pu only public utility service that consumers ingest. There's no room for error because if we do, there's public health crisis, as we've seen in areas more recently like Jackson, Mississippi, Flint, Michigan, Newark, New Jersey. So the reality is, as an industry, delivering a molecule to a home to a tap at a penny a gallon is a great value proposition. And I'm going to add this. You know, we take for granted um, the fact that every day, and even pre-pandemic, that we as an industry, public and private, were able to deliver. There was never a headline in this country during the pandemic that people had a scare about their water delivery. And that we didn't, we didn't take victory laps on that. But the reality is our operators who run our plants, run our wastewater treatment plants, were, as I like to say, doing the boring good every day during the pandemic to make sure consumers across this great country had water delivery and wastewater service. But the reality is, let's face it, we have a water crisis in this country. It's affecting both water quality and water quantity, but we also recognize as a group here today, this morning, is the reality of delivering on the affordability of this utility service and not having a program like, like the LIWAP program really puts us at a disadvantage with other utility groups. So I think to the credit of Congress during the pandemic, standing up this program was a great thing for consumers. It was a recognition, by the way, look at the economics of the pandemic and the impact it had on households. We had segments of our economy where people were wiped out of any means of income. Look at the hospitality industry uh, as an example. Um, so this program was a true safety net. And getting back to the message is it's got to be a permanent program in order to, to, to sustain uh, support for customers who really need it. So again, um, I'm glad to join today with, with my fellow association leaders on this. I think Walt and Rob really, you know, said it all. Nathan, you know, a couple points just to underscore. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, it takes a crisis for folks to recognize just how important what, what service, uh, services they're receiving. In the case of the pandemic, everyone, you know, all of a sudden sanitation became hugely important, ensuring uh, you can had the, the uh, ready supply of water uh, to clean your homes, to clean your businesses, to make sure that everything could continue to function was top of mind in, in the context of a pandemic. It was also the first time that utility workers who go out and fix pipes, make sure you can have uninterrupted service for water and wastewater were deemed to be first responders, essentially. That took us decades uh, to get that point across. No different, I think, in, in the current sort of uh, situation with, with LIWAP. So I think it's sort of, um, we have this moment where everyone recognized all of a sudden the importance of water. As Rob said, to just declare this a one-time emergency effort, I think is completely misplaced and we need to capture that sort of energy in a bottle for, for the long term and make sure that we now uh, make that case that that first responder status, that status uh, that we need in terms of being treated equally across all other infrastructure sectors in terms of the safety net program now has to be made permanent and we can't relinquish that capacity right now. We have to redouble our efforts, and that's the point of, of this report, and I hope people hear us loud and clear in Congress, at HHS, at EPA, et cetera, across the board to collaborate and make this program successful. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's unfortunate that we've gotten to this point. Um, again, it, it, we would all want for our fellow citizens to have everyone at an economic level uh, where they could afford um, the, the basics of life, uh, including water. And, and slowly, that's come unraveled. Again, we've seen it in other sectors with heating and housing and food. And, and sadly, we've gotten now to water. So um, this industry is stepping up. We're speaking with one voice. And we're saying, now is the time. Congress needs to step up and to, to fund this program permanently. Uh, we give Congress credit for having stepped into the breach during COVID, but it, it's clear that the need has not gone away. And so it, this is, does have to be a permanent program. Just to um, pile on here, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, in addition to the cost of combined sewer overflow regulatory compliance, uh, expected regulations on PFAS and lead service line 
replacement and just the general aging of the infrastructure, you add inflation and you add supply chain problems. I, I was looking at some statistics, say, on chlorine since 2019. It, it, it's getting close to a 300% increase. So all these pressures um, uh, are there. And, and while our focus generally is on dealing with the infrastructure itself, uh, it's time that we pay attention to the human impacts and especially at the at the low income levels and so again all these circumstances uh, i think recommend that we we look seriously at the liwap program okay. thank you all rob i want to uh, follow up on a, a point you made in your opening remarks about the uh, track record to date of the current liwap program at hhs and um, curious um, you know your your all's thoughts on you know how it's been working, where it's been successful, and, and where might there uh, potentially be some improvements in terms of a permanent program. And Rob, maybe we can start with you, and then anyone else who wants to address that question. Yeah, sure, Nathan. I think it starts with the collaboration, as I like to call it, cooperative federalism working really well, where HHS was able to bring state partners together, uh, the dissemination of the dollars, the coordination with the utilities. Uh, it was a seamless process, and that doesn't often happen in this town with a program like Li LIWAP. Um, and, and obviously building off the successful model of LIHEAP. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, our uh, investor in water utilities had over a 97% penetration rate of dollars, to, dollars out the door to support customers who would have been facing arrearages. Um, that is a true success story. That is efficient delivery. Uh, of this benefit to those customers that were eligible. Uh, we had strong uh, re re participation rates. And again, the collaboration between state public utility commissions, uh, HHS, uh, departments of health and human services in states. Uh, it was again, a very uh, you know, efficient delivery of dollars. I should add, as I sit here today, that the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, the PAPC, issued on April 14th a letter, as many states are doing, to their entire congressional delegations supporting this program. So that's another testament to the collaboration and the support, the universal support, to having permanent funding for, for LIWAP. Yeah, if I can just jump in there, I think Rob, Rob you know, makes a great point about Pennsylvania. I would just say, you know, there are things that still need to be improved about this program. It is still a new program, and in, in uh, different states are handling, you know, the program and its delivery differently. One, one thing that, that's in the report, um, if you read it, and the report makes no specific recommendations, what they do is sort of rate, you know, recommendations across the board in terms of how to structure the program, uh, which I think was very smartly, smartly done. But one option, and we represent public uh, wastewater and stormwater utilities across the country, but if you're a larger public utility, there might be ways to get the funds for this program direct to the utility uh, and allow them in certain circumstances to be able to manage the program. That's very different from uh, the smaller utilities. In our country, for folks who, who may not know this, we have 55,000 drinking water utilities and close to 15,000 uh, wastewater utilities. Um, and they're not all structured the same. If you're very small and have one to two you know, full-time employees managing this type of program, on your own without third party help will be very difficult. If you're a larger utility, you know who's in arrearages, you might be able to find a very easy, quick way uh, to determine who falls under the poverty thresholds and be able to take care of those arrearages much more efficiently. So I do think we have to have um, some level of, of a discussion ongoing, going forward as this program continues to evolve at HHS to ensure that it's being run as efficiently and effectively as possible so that money gets through uh, to the people who need it uh, the most, most efficiently. The other thing I would just add very quickly, and going back to the last question about why now, I do think we're in a, a, a setting where the notion of equity, environmental justice issues, are sort of now really being wrestled with in a very significant way across all infrastructure sectors and across all facets of government services. So I do think we have an opportunity here with this program uh, to really do some good and to take uh, advantage of, of really looking at it through that lens about why now and why, why permanent. I, I would reinforce uh, Adam's point. As I talk to my members, which are drinking water uh, utilities that uh, with Pop, serving populations of 100,000 or more, um, I, I've heard, you know, again from a number of uh, my general managers that 
the money has to come directly to them, and it cannot be mixed into a, a broader pot. It can't be, you know, and, and while we want comprehensive uh, assistance and services, and there needs to be coordination, the money needs to come through to the utility. And, and again, for, as Adam pointed out, for larger utilities, they have great working relationships with their customers. They have, you know, extensive customer assistance programs. They can get that money as, you know, efficiently and effectively to those in need, as Rob pointed out, um, by, by, again, being able to be good stewards of that money and that assistance. So, so I would underscore Adam's point on that. Uh, I would just take this opportunity to kind of give a shout out to HHS in terms of the work they've done since this uh, program was just kind of <laughs> dropped on them like a piano coming out of the sky. And, uh, and they, uh, you know, I think uh, after they got over the initial staggers, they, 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 they leapt to it. They uh, leaned into the project. They had to learn about a whole new sector, the water and wastewater sector, which is much uh, broader in terms of number and scope and diversity than, say, the power sector, uh, 51,000 community water systems, what now, 16,000 wastewater? 16, uh, massive. And we found them to be uh, dedicated, to be transparent, to be open and interactive. And uh, 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 we're, we're, uh, we're, we're pleased that uh, they've taken to this task and would be ready to take on a, a permanent program. Okay. Um, Adam, maybe we'll start with you on this question since you're in the middle. Um, so regardless of how a program is structured, what do you think utilities can do to help ensure that more households that are eligible for the program actually take advantage of it? It's a great question. Um, you know, the obvious goal of the program is to have it reach, you know, the maximum amount of uh, households that it, it can possibly reach, I think, in, in line with what both Rob and Tracy have said. You know, HHS is a doing a really good job trying to stand that up, work with the right third parties, follow the LIHEAP model well to, to access um, folks. I, I do think there might be some ways, though, to uh, improve that, um, to be totally frank about it. And, and I think we need to look at what the report's recommendations were and, and think about how we can create the, the least possible, uh, as, as few possible barriers in the way of folks coming forward uh, as possible, and in certain circumstances, maybe have different options for different uh, utilities in order to assess what the most uh, strategic um, and effective way to get that money out can be. And I do think there is a difference in, in, in governance issues within the utility sector. Uh, I think the private sector utilities who may be broad-based in terms of, of ownership can have, uh, to some degree, uh, a lot more impact, right, and capacity, uh, as well as the large utilities in the public sector uh, compared to some of those small, <laughs> small entities. So to me, if there are options uh, that can be worked into legislation or regulation in terms of how the program is structured, not immediately, not now, our main goal is funding on a permanent basis to do this, but to work that out over time uh, in order to ensure uh, that most efficiently, the greatest number of uh, households in need uh, can be certified and approved to get that funding is the most critical aspect of this, in my view, to make it work as efficiently as possible going forward. And that's where all of our respective uh, brain power, ideas, resources, capacity need, need to be targeted. Anyone else? We need to get it funded. We need to, you know, we need to work together to get it funded. I think we need to raise awareness, too. Um, I, I think there are a lot of good groups out there that are advocating for people, you know, who are economically disadvantaged or people who you know, are in need of environmental justice. And I think getting those groups on board, working with us, staying together as a group, uh, speaking with one voice uh, as the water industry, I think all of those things and helping educate uh, members of Congress to the importance of doing this and doing it now, I think is is critical for our success. Yeah, and, and to pick up on that, I mean, you can't underscore what Adam just said about the need to have flexibility within this program. You know, look, what works in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania might not work in Des Moines, Iowa. And, and that's, we have to recognize those regional differences um, and provide those utilities the flexibility. 
But the one thing I don't think any of us would waver on is how our frontline personnel within these utilities have gotten the promotion of the dollars, meaning the ability to touch the customer and to get them enrolled is something that has been a success story across all sectors of, of the water industry. Uh, that's gonna, that, that only has to, uh, hopefully continues because again, if this program goes dark, my fear is we're going to one, create an environment where uh, rearages are certainly gonna go up. Um, and as we get through uh, where we are in this economic cycle, uh, we need healthy utilities and we need to provide some type of safety net as we do on the electric and gas side. So, you know, LIHEAP funding is, is a critical piece of that. So uh, I just can't underscore the fact that, again, um, this program's working remarkably well. And to Tracy's point, HHS deserves a lot of the credit uh, to, to be able to in less than a, what, less than a 24-month period uh, to see us here today talking about the virtues of how this program's working is, is a testament to that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so now the million dollar question, or perhaps eight billion, depending on how you're counting. Um, so the report indicates that the annual dollar amount to fund a permanent low income water program could range anywhere from about 2.5 billion to almost 8 billion annually, depending on how the program is structured. In today's political climate, what do you think the most effective argument will be to secure that type of new appropriations? And I'm gonna just see who's courageous enough to take that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I guess, you know, a couple of things that strike me is, is that, first of all, regardless of our current political climate, um, I think the American people genuinely are compassionate and care about other people. And that's what's made us a, a great country. And so I, I don't think any American would, would turn their back on others. And their representatives are not going to either. So I think that that's the first, that's the, 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 the fact that this is such a basic fundamental thing. And, and turning off somebody's water is not just a, a crisis for that family, it's a crisis for the neighborhood and the community because it, it, can, it can signal or start a decline in a neighborhood and a community. So for that perspective, it's in everyone's best interest to keep water flowing. And the other thing is, to put it in perspective, this is at the high level, it is 15 one hundredths of 1% of the federal budget. And of discretionary spending, which is less, it's still one half of 1%. So we are not talking, while it sounds big to us as real people, um, in, the, in the context of the federal budget, it is not significant. But the impact that it makes on people's lives is huge. And so therefore, I think that Congress will do the right thing. Yeah, I, I wanna jump in on that as well because I, I was, when I got up this morning, I was doing just a quick back of the envelope uh, research project. So I stumbled upon a Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation report. And it starts like this. They surveyed five different areas, uh, uh, not only of the country, but looking at the households uh, and, and some, some macro trends in the economy. So as we sit here today, uh, half of the households in the four largest cities in the U.S., so that's New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston, report serious financial problems, including depleted savings, trouble paying bills, and affording medical care. That's, a, that's pretty universal. I don't care. Um, you know, it probably holds true in my city of Philadelphia. At least four in ten Latino, Black, and Native American households report using up, up or, or most of their household savings during the pandemic. Um, and then one in five households in the United States report household members unable to get medical care for serious health care and a majority of them unable to get uh, needed uh, medical care for health. health. Um, the list goes on. I mean, we look at the discussion around 34 percent of the U.S. not having high-speed Internet connection. Uh, this, is, this is part of that discussion. Uh, and I think Congress recognizes that. Um, I don't think we're looking to, to you know, funding at $1.1 billion was a great demonstration that this project, this program works, but getting to three, getting to four, getting to five billion, uh, we're going to hit more 
you know, at 450,000 households in the U.S., added funding should only show uh, increased metrics in participation. So um, we're not out of the woods yet. That's basically my message. And having this program with permanent funding is only going to help those in need. I would, I would just add one one part of it, you know, whether it's uh, the 2.4 billion to the 7.9 billion, which is the estimated need in the report, uh, anywhere along that spectrum, it, it, I'm just going to say it, it's a pittance. I mean, we've just been through the largest single spending, you know, spree on behalf of infrastructure and other issues to the tune of trillions of dollars. You know, $55 billion was uh, spent on water infrastructure, right, to, to be invested over the next five years. Um, this program at that type of, of level, uh, in my view, from a federal standpoint, the payback would be uh, enormous, right? You're talking about ensuring utility sustainability. Every job in our country depends on water and water resources, ready access to that for businesses, for industry, for agriculture. Uh, to me, um, it's, it's fairly clear that that, that amount uh, is, is actually, in my view, quite modest in terms of what would be needed for this program. And if you compare it to other uh, equivalent uh, subsidy style programs, um, again, uh, fairly modest in, its, in, in, in that, that need. Yeah, um, you know, to govern is to choose, and uh, priorities have to be set. And uh, I think, Adam, you raised the question, why not water? I mean, we take care of the power customers, the food customers, the, any number of areas, housing uh, needs. And, uh, um, you know, these are tough choices. Uh, you know, the numbers you know, relative to the whole budget, but th there are tough choices. So how the sausage is made will be a difficult process, but uh, I think we're entitled to make this case where I think it's an imperative, as someone said, that we make this case on behalf of our customers and um, and it will be for uh, policymakers to, uh, to make the hard choices. Okay, go to our last question before we do a Q and A with the audience. Um, and this is for each of you. So what are the key messages that each of you want Congress and the administration to take away from the joint memo and report that are being released today? And maybe, Walt, we'll start with you and work our way down. Uh, boy, there's a bunch in there. I, th I think the first is this uh, is an efficient program. It has a history already, despite being set up in such a short time. Uh, you know, Americans are compassionate, as, as Tom mentioned and don't want to let their neighbors down, but they want efficiency there, right? This is a program that has already demonstrated a rifle shot. We're able to get benefits directly to the people that they need, and I think that's something that the American uh, populace can really get behind uh, and support. Uh, so I'd start at that. It's a tough act to follow. I, I could not agree more. Uh, now more than ever, you know, congressional action to, to support this program into perpetuity with with modest increases and we saw that with lie heap over time uh, again as I stressed earlier this this is a bipartisan issue this is addressing a critical need in our society I don't care if you talk to uh, what economist uh, what community activists what public utility we all agree um, that this is this is a very big issue for our country so not providing this safety net to those eligible customers uh, would be a lost opportunity. And for without long-term funding of this program, as I alluded to earlier, this program going dark is going to set up a whole another set of challenges for utilities, water and wastewater utilities, both public and private here in the U.S. And I hate to fathom that. And again, I think the policy recommendations are very straightforward. Efficient delivery of the dollars to the customers so they can get through this period of a rearage or unemployment where they can afford their water and wastewater bill points. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's very straightforward. The lack of running water makes a dwelling ininhabitable. It's pretty straightforward, but Walt said it earlier. Water is life. The interconnection of water with energy and w delivery of this sustainable resource to homes and businesses, uh, we can't operate as a society without it. So it's pretty straightforward. Only thing I would add, nothing to add to that great statement. Um, uh, the only thing I would add is, is the report itself, if you read it, um, and I recommend to all of the media, you know, in the room or, or who are watching virtually, um, the report, you know, suggests different options that are out there. 
Um, we as organizations believe HHS is the appropriate house for this. Um, it's where it is now, it is working very well. Um, we need to continue to, to work on that and, and make it permanent, but what's really important about the report itself are the groups who are on it. Um, and the fact that all of the groups within the sector from every different perspective that they can be coming from agree with the notion of a permanent program at HHS is crucial. It's critical um, and, and it will lead to, in my view, ultimately the realization of, of this program. And that's when you know you sort of have captured something, is when the plethora of groups that have had input into this report, the plethora of groups that are going to be out here lobbying in D.C., the groups who are sitting on this stage, all come together, right, to agree in a nonpartisan fashion, as Rob mentioned before, that everyone right up on the Hill should be supportive of this effort. Um, that's when I think, that's what I think the, the crucial uh, factor of, of the report is, and, and I think it's why we're going to succeed. Yep. The other is, again, uh, I'm going to pick up on two things Rob talked about. Rob talked about the, the impact on cities, and he mentioned a number of my members. Um, that's, that's important, um, but it's also the reason it's going to be bipartisan is because there's also a crisis in rural areas in areas that are being depopulated, in areas that are struggling with, with infrastructure that is um, obsolete and needs to be upgraded. And so it's, it, it's not something that's limited just to big cities. The, there are communities all over the country that are struggling. And, and there are people, there are pockets of poverty throughout our country, in rural areas, urban areas, throughout. And that's why, again, Members of Congress know this. Members of Congress care about these people and want to take care of them. And that is why Congress ultimately, as we educate members of Congress, as we work with them, they will, they will fund this program and make it permanent. I would just go back to, again, uh, my uh, salute to uh, NACWA and to the expert panel to put this together, report together. Anybody who's worked in this town any amount of time knows that there's flackery and powder puff <laughs> documents that are cranked out for political purposes. <laughs> this is a substantive document. This is a challenging document. And it creates a new reality in that it brings information forth and, and shapes it into usable, uh, 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 usable concepts that we drawn on and come together to support. And uh, uh, again, uh, I think it, it, I commend the report to anyone who's seriously interested in this issue of of uh, low-income customers and, and water service. And again, uh, thank uh, NACWA and the expert panel. Great. Well, thank you all for that. We do have a few uh, moments if there are uh, any questions um, from the audience. Thanks very much. Um, I know several of you have touched on um, how, how you go about improving equity uh, in terms of uh, um, um, delivering these basic water services. How does establishing in the uh, federal assistance program uh, uh, do that, in, in particular in, in the environmental justice communities? Anyone want to take that? I, I think it's ecumenical. I, I mean, use whatever term you want. Humanitarianism, equity, EJ, uh, black, white, poor, yellow, whatever. It, it's a program we need for all our customers, and whether it's you know, poor African-American communities in the cities, uh, rural white communities. Uh, it, it's very American. Yeah, I think the, the whole purpose of this, frankly, is about equity and environmental justice. Um, you know, I think uh, if you look across uh, the issues that we're facing right now, whether you look at Jackson, Flint in the past, right? You have communities who, quite frankly, and you can argue about the reason for it, have been ill-served. Um, and, and I think we're at a point uh, in our country where we need to recognize the fact that that is the case. And the truth of the matter is it's going to be through programs like this that some of those issues uh, can get taken care of. Obviously, not all of those very critical issues, uh, but I think this is a critical step in dealing with environmental justice and equity related issues across across the board right and and some of this is is a, a different issue you know the bipartisan infrastructure law is trying to work right now to you know deal with a lot of the i think even even more difficult uh, and and uh, intractable intractable issues and those are folks who don't even have service right here we're talking about 
you know, paying for bills that are in arrearages for folks who can't pay, who are getting bills and receiving bills. Some folks that aren't even on the water systems, right, that we're talking about here, whether you're talking about Indian reservations and elsewhere, right? So I, I don't think this is gonna be the, the thing to solve every right aspect of the environmental justice or equity debate. It's mixed with all of the other tools that are out there, but what this does do is add one incredibly significant, meaningful tool to start to address that and to help address it. And, and to pick up on that, I think uh, uh, collectively as a group, I think we all recognize water is a human right. So to, to the earlier point, it's not just a rural issue, it's not just a big city issue or suburban issue. Uh, it cro create, cr uh, cuts across many different geographic boundaries and socioeconomic boundaries. And what we've learned through this program is we're able to get to those most eligible customers to help them get through um, potential rearages that cause great strain in the household. Um, you're, you know, fat, you know, as I said earlier, LIHEAP has a 40-year track record of delivering results and helping customers and making sure they're not shut off during the, the, the winter season and then helping them uh, through a budget billing process with assistance. Well, one would, would, would probably many of you would say, well, why doesn't that exist in the water industry? So that's why we're here today. I mean, this cuts across all parts of our society. Um, and we all know someone or a family that's been impacted by the pandemic. But then going ahead, look, water equity starts with the ability to provide customers safe and reliable service that meets world-class federal and state environmental standards so we don't have a Flint or, or a Jackson crisis. And obviously, as you heard across the table this morning, is the ability to fund some of the challenges on the horizon. Lead service replacement line uh, replacement, uh, emerging contaminants, investment in cyber and physical security of these assets cannot be, cannot be discounted. So that's why, again, I think we all join together in recognizing water is a human right. We have a segment of our population that is still going to have ongoing challenges, and having a permanent program that can deliver assistance is, is the pathway forward. I, I keep coming back to Rob's point. Water you know, is a human right. It takes challenges to deliver it in today's world. We, you know, how people were able to get their water a hundred years ago is a little different than today, uh, but we have the means to do this, and this is a very cost-effective way uh, to provide that assistance. And uh, I, I think the American people, when they see cost-effective ways to solve problems, they get right on board, and this is a great example of it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Um, I understand in the report. Uh, there's a needs assessment of kind of the quantifying the overall need uh, in, in, for, for low-income households. I've heard figures in the, the billions of dollars um, per year in annual, annual federal funding uh, needed. Could you tell, tell us a little bit more about the significance of that needs assessment, um, kind of putting us in context of where this number is at now in terms of the need you know, versus past years, is it higher or lower, and what are some of the factors that are influencing that uh, that situation. Thanks. Well, I, I just, you know, I, I think the need, there's been a need for a long time. So that, that's really not an issue. I think what's exas, we've talked about the situations that have exacerbated uh, the problem. One is the, the issue of income distribution and how that's, uh, that's aggravated this. Uh, uh, COVID, of course, is part of it. And now inflation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are other broader social uh, developments that are sort of beyond my expertise that all contribute to this. But it, it has been a longstanding issue, and uh, certainly within the water sector, there have always been, why not a lie heap for water? I mean, I heard that 30 years ago. And, uh, uh, and so now we're at the point maybe where we've got critical mass, both in terms of the reality we deal with and then the uh, political awareness of the problem. And I'd also add, you know, most public utility commissions are looking, as you look at the electric and gas side, you have already established customer assistance programs leveraging LIHEAP. Well, they are now kind of moving along that pathway, states like Illinois and Pennsylvania and New Jersey. You know, having customer assistance is a recognition of the need uh, for funding. 
And then if you overlay that with LIWAP, Ly, Ly, uh, another added benefit to those, uh, those customers that need it. Because going back to the earlier point, look, the trend line of investment spend needed, uh, we can all probably throw a number out there, but I'll start with, you know, we'll go with our American Society of Engineers saying a trillion dollars of spend needed. We're grateful for the 55 billion that the administration has put into the water grid, but some would argue the water grid is too big to fix. Uh, and the reality is, aside from the fix of the infrastructure, which we're all doing every day, is the reality of not losing sight of protecting those customers so they can afford the service. And as I said earlier, um, you know, people, you know, we've had weather related events in this country where people lose power, but losing water service to a home, and no utility, by the way, wants to have to ever shut off a customer uh, for water service. It creates a lot, it's, you know, on and off and getting a crew out there to get the meter set back up. Um, and, and that's not what we want to do. So again, going back to permanent funding, standing up this program is a pillar that we all agree upon. Just, just to, to build on that a little bit, Rob's point, the, the you know, 500 billion to a trillion dollar need is a 20 year cost estimate, right? Over the next 20 years. So if you take that for what it's worth, $50 billion a year, right? Is sort of the, the gap right, that you're talking about between what's currently being spent by utilities and what would need to be spent in order to meet our infrastructure challenges. Okay, out of that 50 billion of need that's out there, you have to add the affordability component, right? So you're talking about 2.4 billion to 7.9 billion of additional need. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to ratchet down that 50 billion in needs so that we become fully sustainable in terms of our infrastructure, right, in the next 20 year cycle. Right, so that, that increment, if you're at $50 billion and you're talking, let's call it the high end of that estimate, 7.9 to $8 billion, if you can address that, right, the utilities begin to become more sustainable, they can raise the rates they need to raise, and I would argue that out of all of the funding that we're talking about, 95% of that funding is gonna be local. Mm -hmm. And any handcuff you can remove from a local utility to be able to raise the rates they need to raise in order to be sustainable for their communities, right, is incredibly mm -hmm. critical. So that number that you're looking at is actually quite a fairly uh, modest right, percentage of the overall funding need that you need in order to meet regulations, as Tracy was talking about, rebuild your infrastructure that needs constant updating, just like your home, right? And if you can access, address this affordability gap right, through this LIWAP program, right, it's an easy one in terms of, of adding to this overall sustainability of the water sector from an infrastructure funding standpoint. That's why I think that number is so critical in the report, not because it's such a huge number, right, but because it's a fairly addressable number from a congressional standpoint. Great. All right. Thank you all very much. Last call. Any questions? All right, well, let me thank all of our speakers for being here with us this morning. Uh, I thank you all for being here both in person and online. Um, we will have an opportunity, uh, if you want any one-on-one -on -one interviews with any of the speakers, we can either do that here or um, you can use the contact information in the news release uh, for this event as well. We're happy to do that. So thank you for your time this morning, and that concludes our event. Thank you. Thank you.